Hi, I'm Rebecca M. Carroll, and we are finishing up our third series, which has to do with student scholarship portfolio. This is part of our master class. This is the section that's really focused on what students can be doing. And it's also one of the ones that we know this section in itself is going to be important for you and is probably not going to change. Now, section two, part two of the master class, which is financial aid, and part one, which was focused on what we do as a company, our different products, as well as just the, the things that we think we should be focusing on and how we operate our business. Those are the things that we basically tell our story. Part two, I just have to say out loud, is probably going to be changing significantly, partly because we're unclear with COVID-19 how colleges are going to be funding. We're assuming that we are going to be utilizing the same strategies, but I can promise you, if we see, and we are looking at this constantly, if we see changes, if we see anything that's being released that indicates there are other strategies that you can use based on the future and what's going to be happening. For example, we know UCLA has announced that they're gonna be online in the fall. Okay, we already put that out. We've already let people know. So we will, our promise to you is part two, which is basically financial aid, we will be keeping tabs on what colleges are going to be doing. We are going to be asking colleges the hard questions for you, and then we will be updating you continually. So let's go to part three, which is your scholarship portfolio. Students need to get this stuff together. It is super helpful because when you're applying for colleges, you're in the middle of your senior year. It's very stressful. There's hard deadlines. Some of you have talent, whether it's athletics or whether it's music or dance, and so you have an extra layer. So this is why we suggest and we have for you a list of things that we have found should go into your portfolio, which help you as a student, any student, apply for scholarships and not waste time. So let's begin. So here's the questions we have. When do we begin looking for scholarships? Can we get a sports scholarship? Do I have to write an essay? So I'm just gonna answer those three. <laughs> the sooner you're identifying scholarships that you can utilize, many of the scholarships come round and round. So you can assume that they will be during your senior year coming out roughly within a, the two week window that is being suggested. So if you want, if you have time, and are highly organized, you can look as early as ninth grade and start looking at scholarships that you qualify for. Sports scholarships. Well, um, we have a whole master class on athletics. Yes, there are people, and we hear about it all the time, who do actually get a sports scholarship. That is less than 10%, uh, way less, that's 2% of the United States. Uh, when you're, here's just a little statistic, if you're thinking about football, there are a million high school football players. So <laughs> they are not all going to be getting scholarships. But there's other strategies, and I encourage you to go into our athletics masterclass, which goes over what you can expect for scholarships. It's very well received, it helps students. And honestly, if you are an eighth grader with a lot of talent, and it appears as though you're going to continue doing your athletic uh, pursuit within high school with the intention of going off to college, it will make a lot of sense for you to be looking at it as an eighth grader. So I encourage you to go into that master class. Do you have to write essays? I'm just going to tell you our statistics within our own business, and I can only speak for my own students really validly, my students who are qualifying for the most scholarships are writing around 25 scholarship essays. And that's just a minimum. There are some that are, are up into the high 30s. 
So it depends on who, where you're applying, what opportunities you qualify for, and yes, that's one of the things that they are looking for. So if you not only are applying to a college just for admissions, that's one essay. So sometimes it's one essay plus several supplemental essays. That's not even the scholarship essays you're going to be writing. And you cannot use those essays. They have to be different. They're asking different questions. They're looking for different things. So yes, yes, you will be writing essays. Please expect it. <laughs> so can you get a scholarship if you're in the top 10% of your class? You sure can, but only if you're applying. And then, you know, how do we qualify if you have excellent grades? Well, many of the scholarships we're finding out have to do with leadership and have to do with either community service or an experience you've had that you can write to. Can you get a scholarship while in college? That's the biggest mistake kids make. They are not continuing to look for scholarships. They forget, they get busy. You should be looking for scholarships all through college. Many, many state colleges have really nice scholarships junior and senior year. I have had kids who do not qualify at all for, for any type of scholarship that has to do with financial means. They, they don't need, they don't qualify as need um, by the federal government standards. And oftentimes they can get, I've seen them get their whole senior year paid for. So it's important for you to be looking at scholarships even in your first year of college so you can line yourself up. So let's begin. You know, what is a scholarship? It's free money. Free. And it basically can go by academic major. It can be uh, grades, test scores. There's grid award where they take your GPA for the whole of your high school. And they also take your strongest SAT or ACT score. They calculate it and that's you're automatically given no matter what this certain amount of money. Athletic abilities, that can also uh, help you. Religious affiliation, first generation, that's for students whose parents did not go to college. So for myself, when I talk about that mistake I made with financial aid the first and second time that I went to school, my parents had five children, three of us went to college, we were all considered first generation and I know none of us knew that. So. Here's some examples where you can get scholarships with your community service through club affiliation, union membership of your parent, sibling order. I've had siblings go to the same college and they have been offered real, a really nice package because they wanted both of them. Uh, so that's happened over the years because I've been doing this for 20 plus years. Or if you have an older sister or brother who are attending, they do like to see that and oftentimes they will reward you for that. Uh, employment. So we have a young uh, international student who actually has been here for quite a while who was hired by a restaurant and that restaurant gives an opportunity for you to go to an online school while you're working and it, they pay for it. So basically this student is getting a free education which is fantastic and since it's in computers he really doesn't care if he's in classes or not. His preference is to get this done, get it paid for, such a smart move so that when he, he's planning on getting his master's then he can focus on how he's going to pay for that. Ethnicity, there are many schools and that's something to look at. If you are a certain ethnicity and the school doesn't have a lot of your particular ethnicity and they, they would like to encourage more diversity to their campus, that's oftentimes a way for you to strategically look at colleges and to have a voice for your particular ethnicity. Military, best kept secret, ROTC, really important to see what people are doing, what colleges are doing, how strong are their ROTC scholarships. Many of them are really, really good. And you really need to be looking at these private schools and find out because if you even have had an inkling of wanting to be a leader, you would be surprised at all the opportunities with ROTC 
the many different branches, it's important for you to explore that as a strategy. So we need a portfolio. Why? Because your memory is not that good. And when you're sitting down and you realize that in two days you have a very good opportunity through a scholarship and it's a hard deadline and you have classes and you're overbooked or you have practice and you can't miss it, it is important for you to have this portfolio together because that's what happens. All of a sudden you'll recognize, wow, I qualify for this. I need to sit down and get it done. And if your portfolio is together, then you'll have it. So senior year is just full of deadlines. And honestly, the first round of scholarships are coming out right around October. And many of my students are working on these these particular scholarships, which are meaty. I, there, I have seen some scholarships, especially the larger ones, require five essays and data and references that are confirming that you actually did what you're stating you did. So it's important for you to understand that, that it takes time. Pulling together a portfolio will help alleviate the stress. It travels with you many, many degrees. Ask, what did you do in high school as well as college? I know for veterinary medicine school, they are interested in how many hours you've had with animals. So many times, the best way to get hours with animals is to volunteer, and so you want to keep track of that. You don't want to have to think, wow, when, okay, I know I did that. I did this during high school. How many hours? You don't want to do that. So having a portfolio together, yes, it takes time. Sometimes it feels like it's overkill, but you will be very happy as you're bringing it along and developing it in your college years. Many department scholarships require documentation of community service. So it's important, you know, when I'm saying department, you're already at your undergraduate, you need more money, it would be helpful you're applying for a department scholarship, you've been recommended by a professor to do that, it's important for you to be able to fulfill that. The easiest way is to have a portfolio that travels with you. So what makes a good portfolio? We like to see a course plan for high school and college. Why? Because many scholarships ask you for it. This is not a resume. This is not a transcript. They are asking you what your goals are. They are asking you what you're putting down and required to complete. They want to see this and they want to see if you're actually really qualified for this particular scholarship. Your resume, including awards. Now, we have several students who are, uh, they're athletes, so we encourage them to make an athletic resume. They're leaders or they're musicians. So depending upon your particular talents, the schools you're looking at, the scholarships you're looking at, you may have to have three or four different resumes. I would always encourage you to have a resume for work. And that's helpful. And if you haven't had a lot of experience with work, you might want to put your academic information briefly. But there are different strategies to be used, and you should have several resumes. Transcripts. I can't tell you enough. Please, at the end of every semester, please look at your unofficial transcript. And it wouldn't hurt you at the end of each year to get a, an official transcript sent to you so that you see what's going out to colleges. The reason why I like to see this is there have been glitches in systems. Uh, where we've seen ninth grade coursework in a junior year, we have uh, glitches and you have to remember teachers are trying to get their grades in and they sometimes will put the wrong grade. I know for my son who um, there was a B, he had earned a B in a class and it ended up a D and we looked at the transcript, we called the teacher, she corrected it immediately. You know these are things that you need to be looking at. Sometimes particular courses are missing so you want to be able to see what is on your transcript. And it's up to you to really verify that, oh yeah, this is exactly what I've taken. It's not just all on the teachers. 
they have a ton of grades to put in. And yes, for the most part, I can honestly say that teachers do a really nice job with that. I think there are uh, times where we have to encourage students to ask teachers to put their grades in sooner as far as the day-to-day -day grades throughout the semester so we can see what they need to improve on and, and what things they're not understanding. And that happens at the college level as well. But for the most part, I would say teachers are really good and you have different tools like PowerSchool or Infinite Campus where you can be checking and you can see what are you missing, what's due, things like that. So you have to be part of the team. You have to be part of looking at your transcript and identifying any errors that may exist. And I'm not talking about challenging a grade because you got a B plus instead of an A and you feel like the teacher owes you that. I'm not talking about that. I just sheer, is this data correct? Is everything that I took on here, are the right grades on there um, based on the scores and the stuff that you have handed in and your homework and stuff like that? Next thing I like to see is I like to see that your scores, your standardized scores are downloaded, printed out. So when I talk about this portfolio, I'm talking about keeping a digital copy of everything but I'm also talking about keeping a three ring binder with things printed out so that as you're filling stuff out or typing, you can look at this three ring binder and flip through it and put your information in. So your standardized scores, you should have all of them. There are some colleges that want every single score, every single test that you have taken. Others ask you to submit just the, the score reports that reflect the scores that you would like calculated. So it's important for you to have all of them. References. So basically references are working in two different ways. If you are applying for a pretty large scholarship, I'm still seeing where they like to see a really good one-page reference specific to what this scholarship is asking given by a person that can validate what you're saying or doing and, and hopefully you're not embellishing because your references from these people, if you're saying one thing and they're saying another, it's not gonna look good. So references are important, but you should also be gathering references like, okay, my sophomore year, National Honor Society, the person who was in charge of that is this teacher, first and last name, email, and the phone number for the school. That's all you need. So you need to be collecting your references. If you're working at a food bank and there is someone who's above you who's managing or training the volunteers, very important, first and last name, many students by senior year they can't remember the last name of the person. They may have heard it once. The person might have a name tag that only says Amy. So it's important for you to ask for the first and last name, especially by the end of a month of working somewhere or volunteering somewhere, and ask that if you need a reference, would you mind giving your email and phone number? Some ask for both. Some ask for one or the other. So it's important for you to get an email and a phone number. The other thing is admissions acceptance letters. You are going to be applying for colleges. Uh, the, many colleges are going to accept you. You're applying for scholarships. The scholarships are requesting that you prove that you have been accepted. And this is oftentimes what's called those outside scholarships. They don't, you don't have to just send an admissions uh, acceptance letter for a college that you absolutely want to go to. You can, you can submit any. And if you are a winner of that, if you've earned that scholarship, then they'll ask you to verify which college you're actually going to go to. So it's important for you to save these admissions acceptance letters and so that you can support that yes, you have been accepted 
and not every call not every scholarship asks for it but many do you need to identify the scholarship by name keep track of it excel sheets work google google docs you know you can do it any way that's comfortable for you but you really need to keep that laundry list and when you've applied and when it's due your EFC from your FAFSA. So when you fill out your FAFSA, which again, I'm gonna state that in my second part of this series, your parents should be filling it out. At the very least, you should be there present if your parents choose, but it's not something that you can fill out yourself unless you really are familiar with your parents' finances. So keeping that in mind you do oftentimes need to support that you either qualify for a Pell Grant or you don't. There are scholarships that are really wanting to give money to students who do not qualify for any of the grants and then there's some that want to give it only to people that they consider financially needy based on what the federal government says. So it's important for you when, you when the FAFSA is filled out, you will be emailed and it's a sheet and it's your estimated family contribution. It would, it would do you, a, just it would do you a good service to print that out, download it, make a copy of it for your digital as well as your, your package that you're keeping your three ring binder, slide it in. I love those pr uh, paper protectors. And that would be important for you to have. So some scholarships ask for this, which I prefer because as early as three years ago, they were asking for parents to submit their tax forms. And I'm sorry, but that's just way too much information to be giving over the internet or sending to a group of people that you really don't know. So I, I prefer that this EFC at least identifies um, what the scholarship needs to either support um, that you qualify for a Pell and are considered financially needy or you don't. Okay, one of the things that I like to do is actually show students, real students, and different things that they're doing so that you have an idea. So leadership. National Honor Society is a great place to do leadership. Many schools do not have a great one. They might have it in name only but it doesn't mean that you can't do it. It also doesn't mean that you have to be president or vice president to act to make a dent. These students created a leadership project. They approached National Honor Society. It was approved. And basically they taught a financial literacy course at their local community educational outreach program. And it was great. They ordered the program, they studied it, they put things together, and they presented it in a four-week series. It actually went really well, it was very successful, and I really believe that both of them, because they're both going into business, I think this helped significantly in their acceptance. Uh, both of them actually are attending uh, pretty rigorous private schools, but they also got more money. And I think that speaks to the idea that you don't just have to be president or vice president. It's important though that you look at running a project and approaching your person who's leading National Honor Society and just asking if you can do this particular project. So leadership, here's another scholarship. Many, many colleges now are having leadership scholarships where you actually are invited based on your application. This particular application required five essays. It was intense. This young man was invited. He actually was one of the uh, qualifiers and he won. There were several. This particular scholarship was given to, I believe, 15 people. And his obligation was going to be making sure he had to show up to college two weeks early. He, during the year, he had to participate in a leadership program. And he had to continue to work within this leadership as a student representative for the college. It was fantastic. And this was full ride scholarship. So it is important to look at those leadership scholarships. It is important to go compete. This was a weekend deal. 
Uh, and I really like it. Sometimes colleges are handing you academic papers they want you to read and be prepared to discuss. Other times you have to go and you're just, you know, grouped and the discussions happen impromptu. Either way, it's important for you to go. It's important for you uh, as a leader if you want to continue to do this uh, at the college campus. But if you can get a scholarship and do something that you actually like doing, I would really encourage you to do that. Plus, it's a great way to visit the campus, see if the, the feel of the campus and the programs are, are what you want. So at the very least, it gives you a college experience. So as I have mentioned before, ROTC is a fabulous way to fund your education here. We have a young lady, Casey Thomas, who really wasn't that um, excited about the prospect of ROTC, but I can tell you she was excited about the idea that she could fund her own education and have skin in the game, and she has loved this program. Here's a picture of her in a helicopter. I mean, it was just really a fantastic program for her. She is, she is graduating this year, and as you can see, we have another slide of a young man who also has participated, Eric Lyons, and they've loved it. They've grown. It has helped them to figure out what they want to do, their next steps, and they just they have nothing but great things to say about it. Great people they've met. It's just been a wonderful experience for them. And here we have a student who was interested in the academies. And as you can see, if you are someone who can qualify for the academies, which requires quite a bit of leadership, it's important for you to apply. As you can see, the Air Force, educationally, that is valued at 400,000. So the Air Force Academy, it's a tough application. There are only 12% that are accepted of all the people that apply, but if you can apply and earn a free education, which will give you quite a bit in your next steps after college, it's important for you to do that. So here, uh, he, this just happens to be my son, who two years into college, and he was doing fine, decided he wasn't sure he was studying what he wanted to study. And so he took a break and he enlisted in the Navy. And, and he, here is his ship, the Abraham, USS Abraham Lincoln, which ended up being deployed twice, ended up with the E, which is for excellence, which meant that they, these, these two years during these deployments, he ended up on a ship that uh, was awarded just for their, everything that they accomplished which was really quite amazing. And um, he had a great experience, great experience with it. He learned a lot, came home, and he could use his GI Bill. So that is another way to think about funding your education, and this worked beautifully for him. He still has money left. He can go on to get a master's if he so chooses. Just as a little side note, he is actually um, in the field, <laughs> working in the field that his degree is in, so that's perfect. And he has about three more classes before he'll be completed. But that this is another way for you to look at funding your college. He then transferred into the reserves. He loves the camaraderie, and it's been a great thing. And the reserves, there are different reserve uh, posts in different areas for him. It was right in his location, so that worked out fine. Okay, religious affiliation. Here's a young man that received quite a bit of money. Um, he is attending a college in his same religious affiliation. He went to school. He graduated last year as an engineer. He was able to participate in a leadership scholarship like I had talked about. He was not in the top tier of winners, but unbeknownst to him, after he had participated in this weekend, and there were probably about 40 kids invited. I'm not sure how many kids received the top award, but the rest of the kids who participated in that weekend received a significant scholarship. So 
try to go to these with an open mind and also understand that a lot of schools are rewarding you for this. So it was a really nice perk. So now we have another strategy. This young man decided to go to one of his state schools. He is in the field of education. Colleges have a lot of really good opportunities for students who want to be educators. He was able to utilize the dual enrollment in AP strategy within his high school, and he was able to then graduate from college in three years, which was a money saver in itself. He also double majored in biology and history, and then he minored in Spanish. He ended up getting an internship that's paid because this particular school needed someone and were willing to pay. So he's teaching biology classes, but he is also teaching a history class, one history class, which is his love. His strategy, even though his love is history, was to get the dual major in biology so that he could be hired. He presents himself as an educator well because he was able to do that double major, but the fact that he did it in three years is amazing. And he was fully, fully funded that third year. So he has only had to pay for two years of college, plus he received scholarships to go to the college. So now, and I'm gonna say that this young man did not qualify, he's an only child and did not qualify for any financial need. So don't give up. We just really looked at the schools that would fund him, particularly for his major. And he is going to be staying at the school where they're interning if he stays for two years. His, his school loan, his student loan, will be fully paid for if he stays for two years. And that's a really good strategy for an educator to actually have uh, at least three years at a particular school before they decide to move to another school because he'll get through his first year, which is pretty hairy. <laughs> and I know as an educator when I went, um, I, I actually graduated older and went into school counseling and I, I it was shocking the first year. And once you get through that first year, that second and third year really help you to understand the layout of the land in education, the very um, hot times that you have to be really aware what you have to do and how you have to do it and things like that. So Nick did a great job, great planning. So we have athletes, that's another strategy. And of course we talked about, we have another, we have another master class that's very informative and digs deep into this stuff. I would encourage you to watch it. But there are NAIA scholarships, there are NCAA scholarships. This particular young man ended up having full tuition because he is quite bright and he really worked on getting those scores up. His GPA was very high, but he also had a talent and he chose an NAIA school because they were willing to fund him an extra 20000 so he's able to go to a very expensive private school, play soccer, which is his love, not have to pay a whole lot. I believe his parents said they were roughly paying about $3,000 for, for his education yearly. And because he wants to be a lawyer and he knows he's going to have to pay for that, it's a great strategy to not utilize, uh, you know, to go to a school that you will not have to pay so much to do so you can save your money in order to get to your next level school and his obviously will be law. So where do you look? Well, Fast Web and College Board. But again, if you don't have your EFC, if you do not even have that estimated family contribution, you may spend a lot of time applying for scholarships that you don't even qualify for. Just because you're all sitting at the kitchen table saying, how are we going to afford this? And we don't have enough money for you to go to college does not mean that the federal government thinks that you need money for college. I want you to understand that because this is where I've seen a lot of students who come to our program. They've applied to several scholarships. They haven't heard anything. And we look at, well, it's because you probably don't qualify for financial need, and that is the priority. 
many scholarships in the fine print put financial need will be one of our priorities. That is important for you to understand. So I don't want anybody wasting any time and that's why we have that free estimator. So you have an understanding of your estimated family contribution before you set your kids off on this rabbit hole where they won't be getting any of these scholarships and because they've spent so much time, they end up losing steam. It's, it's a tough thing for kids. Why not have them have all the information ahead of time so they're not wasting their precious time? Local businesses and organizations, many banks give scholarships. And yes, they might be 500 or 1,000 maximum, but $500 will pay for books. And it's important for you to do that. And it's important for you to send a thank you note because oftentimes wherever you got that scholarship, they'll give it to you again. Especially if you do a thank you note and you send grades. That's a really good strategy. Future colleges, that is where the maximum amount of scholarships are. You're, when you are getting your college list together, it is so important for you to be looking at that. And many students don't, but our theory and with the coaching educator is, this is what it's about. You have to take into consideration, can you afford it? Why get into 14 schools that you can't afford? That's not a good strategy. And then to have to default to a community college, which I went to a community college, nothing, nothing against community colleges. Sometimes they have the best programs, but our own tech person is at the community college, which is a fantastic opportunity and degree that's specific to the needs of this business. So we love community colleges, but that shouldn't be the default. College departments. My daughter went to an ag school. My daughter was a pre-vet student. And I gotta tell you, those ag, those ag scholarships were amazing. I mean, they would invite the parents for steak dinners. It was, it was fabulous, it was fabulous. And there were many students who earned these scholarships who would not go to these dinners, which is silly. Uh, my daughter ended up getting extra money. She had a free ride and she got extra money, which helped with her internships and things like that. So specific departments have scholarships. You should be looking at that your place of employment, employment, like I talked about, or your parents. And each state, if you go to ed.gov forward slash E-R-O-D, you will find your state scholarships if you are planning on attending a school in your state. So when do you look as early as ninth grade? Just to kind of get yourself in order and looking at these things and you can actually get an EFC for ninth grade. I, they are looking at you in 10th grade, so it's important for you, that's one of the things we do. We get these EFCs done, estimated family contributions, so you have an idea, and you can start earmarking scholarships. No later than senior year. Deadlines, you know, it's crazy, but you should be applying to scholarships all the way through senior year up until about the end of March. Throughout your college, years. You really need to be doing that. And graduate school, many of the scholarships start coming after unless it's a high need field. With what I've just talked about, you need to be careful. There are every year I have kids get these really hokey letters that, oh, here's your code, register with us, here's your time slot. You need to be very careful. I get them every year from kids, so I'm thankful they forward them to me, and it's amazing the strategies they use, and they look very official, but they're not. No one should ever be saying to you that they're gonna guarantee anything. No one should ever be presenting will qualify you for scholarships. That is not how the scholarship world works. If you are working with a company, such as my, a company similar to my own, the only thing we can do is, is help guide you in being organized 
in being able to put the right information in, putting portfolios together. But other than that, there should be no writing for kids. There should be no actually doing anything other than here's a scholarship that you may qualify for or let's look over a list, let's look together. So be careful of that. Financial aid is another option and that's, you know, understanding financial aid is part two. If you haven't looked at part two yet, it would be important for you to do that. You just need to watch out for scams. So why, why do you have to start so early? A lot of the scholarships are pretty meaty. Those ones, the Coca-Cola, the AXA Achievement Scholarship, anything that's giving at least $10,000 is going to require a lot of data from you and support that you're actually doing certain things that they're going to be giving to you. And you have to remember, we're in a world of the internet. And so it used to be that only a few people would be applying to certain scholarships. Well, now there's thousands of kids, hundreds and thousands of kids. So here is a paper form, which no longer exists with the AXA Achievement Scholarship, but I wanted you to look at, see, here is an example. So this is one of those $10,000 ones. They ask for a lot of data. They then, there are five essays and a lot of this has to do with supporting what you're saying and filling out. This particular one had to have three references and they had to be a, a, a solid written reference. So you need to make sure that you have, you have these references available to you. So here is a young man over to the right. He ended up you know, qualifying, which was really cool put a lot of work into his portfolio, but it also allowed him to apply to all those other scholarships and made it easier. So the AXA Achievement Scholarship, they give one per state, and guess what? Every year one kid wins, so why not? Why not apply for it? So keep a calendar, record your deadlines, record the scholarships that you've applied to. Sometimes you don't even get an answer till June. It's important for you to, oh, Okay, my answer is this, and check it off, and that's great. Use your social networking tools. Be smart about it. One of the ways I've sat on scholarship committees that we end up kind of weeding through when we have that final 10 kids that they all look alike, they all are similar, they have a similar accomplishments, is we go on your social media. And if it's reflecting something different than what the student is reflecting in their application, that's the easiest way to weed out. So I'm telling you, be careful. Use your social media as a promotional way for you. Be healthy on it, be smart, and be careful what you put up or be careful what you like. So you wanna calculate your time on a monthly basis. It's easiest to keep that on a calendar. We actually, as part of our uh, as part of what we give, we give a calendar for people to be marking their hours. You want to recycle your material as well. You might have to write 11 leadership scholarships. Well, you might have a core one that you can clip pieces from it, not just flat out clipping, but you at least have a gist of an idea and then you can write others. So that's one of the strategies that we use. So again, if this is just this reminder of why do we do this? We potentially are heading into another recession. It is important to educate yourself. It's important to utilize these opportunities. It's important for you to be able to get to college with for the least amount of money. And with the last recession, what was happening is students who had some college were hired over ones that didn't. We also, I wanna remind you that we are talking about trade schools as well. So it's important for you to be confident. We like that. We like our students to be confident. And here's a way is to be looking at the pieces that I encourage you to do to put a scholarship portfolio together. We would also appreciate if you would like and share this video. If you know people who would benefit from this video, please, we would, we would encourage you to do that. Also, if you have anything, put in the comments. We'll cover if there's things that you're, you have questions about that you think other people would benefit for, from. Please put it in and thank you so much. Mm -hmm.